the establishment of the Gambia's first National Human Rights Commission and the establishment of the Jane Commission to inquire into the financial corruption of former President Jame, and as a result of which the government has been able to recover over $1.1 billion so far. And in all of these processes, we were able to put together a team of talented and credible Gambians, and I wish to thank them for their service to country. I led efforts to rebuild a hitherto weakened judiciary, and I'm glad that we now have a respectable, robust, and independent organ of state. Immediately after my appointment, I established a criminal case and detention review panel, which reviewed a total of 241 ongoing cases, criminal cases, involving 304 accused persons. I discontinued prosecutions in 36 cases involving 86 accused persons on the basis of insufficient evidence. Reported incidents of arbitrary arrest, detention without trial or torture by state agents, which were a hallmark of the Jame days, have substantially reduced. Freedom of expression, which was a luxury in the past, is now taken for granted. In sum, the Gambia is no longer in a state of fear. On legislative reform, between 2017 and 2020, the ministry has introduced and or revised a total of 47 different pieces of legislation affecting different sectors of government. 26 of these have become law and 23 are now before the National Assembly for consideration. Also during my tenure, the government's commitment to international law has strengthened. We rescinded the decision by the Jame administration to withdraw the Gambia from the International Criminal Court, paving the way for our continued membership to the ICC. We signed and or ratified a number of international treaties including the UN Convention Against Torture, the UN Optional Protocol on the Abolition of the Death Penalty, the UN Convention Against Enforced and Involuntary Disappearance, and the African Charter on Democracy, Elections, and Governance. We successfully submitted our combined periodic reports for the first time since 1985 to the UN Human Rights Council on the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and our combined periodic report for the first time since 1994 to the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. More significantly, we became one of only seven countries at the moment in Africa to make a declaration pursuant to Article 34.6 of the Protocol to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights on the establishment of an African court to allow individuals to have direct access to the court. But a lot still remains to be done. In this regard, I have introduced a number of bills to the National Assembly as part of the government's legislative reform agenda. These include comprehensive amendments to the Criminal Code and Criminal Procedure Code for a radical transformation of our criminal justice system to bring it in line with modern criminal justice norms and practices. In particular, the amendments will introduce non-custodial sentences such as community service, suspended sentences, probation, plea bargaining, and greater flexibility for bail. Other new bills include a prohibition of torture bill which will criminalize acts of torture for the first time in the Gambia. An international crimes bill to cover mass atrocity crimes like genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. An access to information bill, an anti-corruption bill, and various other amendments to remove discriminatory laws against women in our society. In anticipation of the next electoral cycle from next year, 
I have commissioned a review of our electoral laws and the Elections Act in particular, following consultations with the Independent Electoral Commission and all the registered political parties at a seminar that I had recently organized with support from the UNDP and IDEA. Based on ongoing consultations with the IEC, it is expected that a new voter registration exercise and a constitutional referendum will be conducted at least six months before next year's presidential elections. Indeed, some things could have been done differently. In fact, some things can always be done differently. And there is always room for improvement. But those who are constantly looking for mistakes by this government will always find faults because of the unique circumstances in which we find ourselves as a country in transition. We inherited a system of governance where state institutions from the presidency to the lowest levels were systematically dismantled over a two decade period and where we found no culture or practice of state protocol in consonance with democratic practice. In many instances, we have had to rely on conventional wisdom. Given these circumstances, there are bound to be mistakes. But when mistakes occur, point them out in a constructive manner and make suggestions on how to avoid them in future. Do not just sit back and moan and blame. You can surely do much better than that. Unless we forget those countries that currently do better than us in governance have had their own fair shares of trials and tribulations for centuries before getting to their current levels of development and democratic evolution. Ours will come too, but only with time and maturity. During my first engagement with the media, immediately after I was sworn in as Attorney General and Minister of Justice, I announced that my principal objective as Attorney General was to restore public confidence in the administration of justice system in the country. This, of course, was not going to be an easy task, given that we were just emerging from a governance environment that was characterized by direct political interference in the judiciary by the previous executive the unlawful summary dismissal of judicial officers who dared to make decisions against the state or sometimes for unknown reasons, and the hiring of private mercenary judges who sent innocent Gambians to jail on the dictates of one man. Today, only three and a half short years later, I am proud of our achievements in this endeavor. No one can now deny that public confidence in the administration of justice system in this country has not substantially increased. Indeed, as a lawyer, I am heartened to finally see the law in action, even if I don't agree with the outcome at times. More broadly, however, peace and stability and reconciliation must be the preoccupation of any post-conflict or post-dictatorship society. And our decisions at the Ministry of Justice over the past three and a half years have largely been guided by these objectives. There is good reason why the Secretary General of the United Nations included our country in his sustaining peace agenda. There is good reason why the United Nations and other bilateral and multilateral partners such as the African Union, ECOWAS, and the European Union deployed their resources to this country soon after the change and continue to do so. Societies like ours that have been brutalized and traumatized for decades are fragile and must be handled with care. Ensuring peace democracy, development, and stability in that order cannot be achieved overnight in a post-conflict 
or post-dictatorship society like ours. It will take a generation or more to turn this country into a stable and institutionalized democracy. And even then, no government can do it alone. It will require a deliberate effort, individually and collectively, on the part of each and every one of us. There are still many who do not fully understand or appreciate the challenges of reconstructing a post-conflict or post-dictatorship society like ours. It requires a delicate balance across a range of competing political, social, and economic interests. More importantly, doing the right thing at the wrong time, as we have learned from other countries, can unravel all the good work invested in these processes. In the end, painful decisions and sacrifices will have to be made for the greater good. This is a reality that we must all try to live with if we truly want to turn a fresh page in our country. The best thing that has happened to us as a country is the freedom that we all enjoy today. There is simply no price tag to this freedom. The new Gambia is therefore not about winners and losers. We either succeed together or we fail together because as a nation we are bound together by a common destiny. But failure is not an option. And that is why we must persist and we must persevere, especially in the face of adversity. This is the burden of responsibility that we carry as pioneers of this change. Every country on earth has its own set of challenges unique to its historical and political context, and so does ours. Yes, we cannot change this country through the wave of a magic wand, but we can start somewhere. We can start with what we have and preserve it, and that is the peace in this country. It is a national treasure that we must guard jealously. For without peace, there cannot be democracy or development or justice. Our challenge going forward is to make this peace sustainable and turn it into stability for our people. And yes, the choice is ours, each and every one of us. We can either choose to live in peace or not. And we all have a role to play in this, but especially the media. The biggest threat to our peace and fledgling democracy is misinformation. I implore the media to be mindful of your critical role in a fragile democracy such as ours. Do not turn your supporters in government against you by your own actions. Do not under the guise of freedom of expression, ruin the lives and reputations of others simply because you can. In small communities like ours in this country, the consequences of publishing false information can be devastating. The people you write about have families too. Their kids go to school with other kids. Their spouses interact with others at work and at other public places. By all means, expose corruption and corrupt practices in government. But I encourage you to do so with hard facts. And to be fair to some of you, you do to your credit. It will only enhance your credibility. Do not allow those with a partisan political or narrow personal agenda to use you to smear others. Because when you do, you will also discourage honest and hard-working Gambians from accepting to serve in public office and consequently deprive this country of the best human resource talent that we need to develop our country. Government, in my view, 
is a microcosm of society. And I believe that there are more honest people in society than we care to acknowledge. Notwithstanding, it is refreshing to see a vibrant media and an active press corps in the country nowadays. And I, in particular, wish to take this opportunity to say, well done. But in your hands lie the stability of this country. Be responsible about it. To the victims of human rights violations and abuses during 22 years of Jammeh's rule, you will get justice. I have always had you in mind at every stage of our transitional justice process. And I have been committed and dedicated to your cause, to your cause since the first day I was appointed. I know that there have been difficult moments for you and your families in this process. And I can only assure you that it will not have been in vain. I am aware that my principal position on former President Jame has not endeared me to his supporters and sympathizers. And to them, I say, Jame belongs to the past. So wake up from your dreams of a Jame political comeback and move on with your lives. He has caused too much pain and suffering to the people of this country throughout his 22-year reign of terror as the TRRC keeps revealing. He has, during this period, destroyed the innocence and soul of Gambian society with the sheer brutality of his crimes. And for this, he will be brought to account someday here or abroad. He will surely have his day in court. I wish to conclude by thanking many. To my cabinet colleagues, for their esprit de corps and solidarity, particularly in times of adversity. I wish to thank each and every one of you for your support at all times. To the President and members of the Gambia Bar Association and my colleagues at the Bar, for their cooperation and partnership with me and my ministry, our interactions were truly cordial and collaborative. To my critics, and yes, there were quite a few. I thank you too for keeping me on my toes all the time, even if I felt that some of the criticisms were unreasonable or unjustified or unfair at times. But I will choose this life any day over life in bondage under a dictatorship. To the representatives of the international community, and our regional and international development partners in the country, the African Union, ECOWAS, and the European Union. Thank you for standing by the Gambian people at their hour of most need. I particularly wish to thank the entire United Nations system here in the Gambia, especially the UNDP and the Transitional Justice Project Management Unit. To the UN Peace Building Commission, and the Peace Building Support Office under Assistant Secretary General Oscar Fernandez Taranko, who has been an exceptional supporter of the Gambia's transitional justice process and peace building initiatives. To SISG Chambers for his dedication to peace in our country, as well as to IDEA, the Justice Rapid Response, the International Center for Transitional Justice, and the Commonwealth. Please continue to support our country's transition and transformation. The Gambia and her people need you, so do not abandon us. Help us complete this beautiful and inspiring story of a country that rose from the ashes of tyranny and became a modern democracy through peaceful means. The pride will be as much yours as it will be ours. To my family, my friends, and loved ones who constantly encourage me throughout the emotional roller coaster ride of the past three and a half years, I simply cannot thank you enough. Being Attorney General at this time 
in our country is perhaps the most challenging job of this post-dictatorship administration. But you have been my work to lean on. I couldn't have survived on this job for this long without your enduring support and encouragement. There were times when the pressures of being in public office caused too much pain for you. And I am sorry for making you go through these painful moments. I hope that you can forgive me. And to my staff at the Ministry of Justice, I have said previously that I have never worked with a more committed and dedicated team than the men and women of the Ministry of Justice. I could not be prouder calling them my staff. Over the past three and a half years, they have been pushed to their limits to ensure that we deliver on our reform promises to the people of this country. And they have been equal to the challenge. I salute their efforts and determination despite the difficult conditions and the many constraints. There is so much unexplored talent at this ministry. And I can only encourage you to go forth and let fly. Don't allow anyone to make you believe otherwise. When I walked through these doors the first time three and a half years ago, three quarters of professional staff did not have a desktop computer on their tables. They were still drafting legal opinions with pens and paper, as I did here back in 1997 as a public prosecutor. There was no office internet to facilitate online research for the lawyers and even stationaries and vehicles to attend court proceedings was a constant daily struggle. Basic as they seem, it served as an early indication of the acute human and material resource challenges I was to confront as Attorney General in the years ahead. I was, today, I am glad that I will be leaving a Ministry of Justice in much better shape than I found it as Attorney General. I have turned the ministry into a truly professional environment and into a modern state law office that now, among other things, undertakes criminal prosecution without political motivation. But one of my proudest moments as Attorney General was when I was able to improve your conditions of service. I will repeat what I had said in my most recent memo to you about this. The improvement in your conditions of service is recognition of your unique position, not only as professionals in the civil service, but also as the bearers of the torch of justice that should shine across the country. It is a heavy responsibility indeed, but I have no doubt in my mind about your abilities your dedication, and your commitment to meet and perhaps even exceed the expectations of the people of this country. As the old adage goes, to whom much is given, much is expected. To the Solicitor General, Mr. Chairman Marina, thank you for your loyalty. I surely would have been lost in the complex web of government, machinery, and bureaucracy without your steady guidance. To my special advisor, Mr. Hussein Tomasi, I will miss your wisdom, your calm composure, your maturity, and professionalism. Thank you, too, for pulling me back from the brink on many occasions. It has been a pleasure working with both of you. To my secretaries, the general staff at the ministry, including the clerks, the drivers, the cleaners, to my oddly, to my driver, and my designated successive personal assistants, Ms. Mam Job, Ms. Ami Fadera, and Ms. Fatun Yai. Thank you all for your invaluable support to me. I know that I have demanded too much at times particularly with my frequent calls and messages at late hours of the night. And I thank you and your families for showing understanding and patience. Lastly, while my determination 
to make a difference as Attorney General was as dogged as the challenge was daunting. And while I might also have, on occasion, failed to meet everyone's expectations, I am comforted by the fact that I gave my best for my country against many odds, at a most critical period and at great personal sacrifice. The rest of the story I will leave to the students of history. Our country needs all of us, all its sons and daughters, all our different strengths, our collective willpower, and above all, our unquestionable patriotism. To join hands and work together to bring about meaningful change in the lives of our people. This is what our country expects and demands of us at this moment in history. Anything less from us will be a betrayal of that sacred trust bestowed on us since 1st December 2016. So I call upon everyone, especially the political class, civil society organizations, youth organizations, women's groups, and the media fraternity, to refocus and rededicate ourselves to the noble cause of the common good. People have died for this cause, and we must never lose sight of that reality in our dealings with each other. For when we stand together, shoulder to shoulder, it is the Gambia that wins. Finally, I don't even know if I should congratulate or commiserate with my successor, Mr. Dauda Jalo, because this is a very hot seat. But I will remain optimistic and extend my hearty congratulations to him. I wish him well and a successful tenure as AG. I wish to conclude with the touching and sober remarks of Sheikh Kujame of the Gambia Press Union back in January 2017 when he posted this comment, and I quote, the sun is shining on Gambia, not because Jame has gone or that bow is coming, but because Gambia has decided that never again, unquote. I thank you and goodbye.